Okay, so welcome to lecture number two of this uh, sort of random modern mathematical music theory meets basic chord progressions lecture series. For those of you who weren't here the first time, I'm going to give you a little bit of review what I did last week in lecture one, and then we're going to move on to some new stuff. I have to con confess that we're not going to talk about what I promised uh, last time I told you we were going to talk about one thing today, and I'm doing a bit of a bait and switch because I realized that there was enough to follow up from from last time that I want to devote a whole hour today to some odds and ends from last time. So here's the outline for what we're going to do today. We're going to do a brief amount of review. Then we're going to do some analysis specifically of the song um, Halo by Beyonce. Apparently I can't make an accent. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about Halo by Beyonce and analyze it using the ideas that we talked about in uh, the last lecture. Then we're going to add a little bit of nuance to the basic principle or the algorithm that I taught you last time. Not that there's anything incorrect with the algorithm, but there are some interesting corners to its application that you may not have thought to explore. Then finally, we're going to talk about the so-called Mario cadence, a really popular chord progression that happens to show up a lot in the theme song to Super Mario. We're going to talk about that, and that's going to be basically the last thing for today. It turns out to make a really nice bridge into the topic for next time, which is chord progressions that go completely, completely outside of a key, what we might call chromatic chord progressions. So that's the plan for today. And if all goes according to plan, that should take us about an hour to get through. All right, so we'll start off with a little bit of review. Last time, we talked about starting with the problem of just composing a chord progression, specifically what you do the next step after you've chosen a chord progression or some Roman numerals that you want to compose. So for example, let's choose to do the standard four chord loop in the key of A major. One, five, six, four, one. So this is all over the place in modern music. And let's say we know that we want to try to do this chord progression, but we're noobs and we've never actually tried to realize it before. So of course, the first thing you would do if you didn't know Roman numerals, you would figure out what notes belong in these chords. Today we're going to be completely in the key of A major. And for all of these lectures, I'm always going to just write out the base, the bass line as the roots of the chords. So the lowest note in every chord will just be the root. So in A major, the one chord is an A major chord. That is, it has the notes A, C sharp, and E. And I wrote A as the lowest note. So a five chord is an E major chord. I'll go ahead and write an E right there. A six chord is F sharp minor. So I'll pencil in F sharp. A four chord is D major. That would be this. And then we're back to one, A major. All right, and I could go through and I could write out all the notes I need in these chords. So for five, I need E, G sharp, and B. For six, I need F sharp, A, and C sharp. For four, I need D, F sharp, and A. And then for one, I'm just back to A, C sharp, and E. So suppose I figured out all of that. What I'm really interested in is the next step. That is, how do I figure out the voice leading for this passage? And what that means is, how do I take the individual notes from one of the chords and move them to the next chord? Now, the simplest way to do this as a composer is just to move everything uh, everything the same amount. So for example, here,
this C was the third of the one chord. So the simplest thing to do conceptually is to, you know, take it to the G sharp, that's the third of the five chord. This E, that was the fifth of the one chord. So again, the simplest thing to do would be just to take it to the fifth of the five chord. And then A, that was the root of the one chord. So the conceptually simplest thing to do is to take it to E, the root of the five chord. And as a composer, that takes me the least brain power. So that's one way of doing this chord progression. And there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's a successful voice leading. But doing it this way actually makes things harder for the player and for the listener than they really need to be, because it creates a lot of motion between the two chords. Every one of these notes moves really far, a lot farther than they have to do. For example, this top note, A, when it goes down to E right here, it's moving down five semitones, like five frets on a guitar or five keys on the piano. That note doesn't have to move nearly that far to get from a one chord to a five chord. It started on A. Instead of going all the way down to this E, it could just go down to G sharp right here. That note is also in the five chord. And if it does that, it's only moving one half step rather than five. Likewise, this E, instead of going all the way down to B, well, it's it could just be happy to live out its life as the note E, since that note is in both chords. And finally, C sharp, instead of going down to G sharp, it could go to B, like so. And if I do it that way, and think about how far each note has to move between the two chords, you see that doing it this way involves a lot less motion. That's smoother for a listener, and it's much easier to play, at least on some instruments like piano. Um, I have to admit, I don't play guitar. I don't really know how fingerings on guitar work. But I would imagine there's some similar sort of uh, thought process that goes into choosing uh, fingerings for chords on guitar. So making decisions like this is what's called choosing the voice leading for a chord progression. We think of like these top notes as like a voice, like there's some singer or some instrument playing those notes. And we're thinking about how do you lead that singer through the notes in the chord progression? That's where the term voice leading comes from. And we're interested in choosing the voice leading that requires the least amount of motion. Last time I was calling that the laziest voice leading between chords. I think for the rest of this lecture series, I'm going to lose the metaphor and just call it the smallest voice leading between two chords. So that's the big question that we answered last time, is when I'm writing a chord progression in within one key, like within A major, how do I figure out the smallest voice leading between any two chords? And we, and we learned that there's actually a really nice, simple rule for that using two concepts called upshift and downshift. And the way that those work is you take every note and you simply move it up or down the smallest amount possible, including if a note is shared between the two chords, like E and E here, you just leave it the same. You think of that as moving by zero. And when I'm working within a single key, I do all the notes moving up or all the notes moving down. So for example, going from five to six, it turns out that the smallest voice leading between those two chords is what's called an upshift. G sharp moves up to the nearest note above it, which would be A. E moves up to the nearest note above that, which would be F sharp. And B moves up to the nearest note above that, which would be C sharp. And that turns out just moving all the notes up turns out to be the, the smallest connection between those two chords. Again, I can think about how far each one moved. G sharp moved a half step, one up to A. E moved up a whole step, which is two semitones up to F sharp. And B moved up two to C sharp for a total motion of five between these two chords. Now to go from six to four, how do I do that? Well, that turns out to be pretty easy. A 
doesn't have to move at all because A is in those two chords, so that can just stay where it was. F sharp also just stays where it was. And C sharp moves up just a little bit to D, like so. So this turns out to be an especially small connection between two, between two chords because these two voices don't move at all, and this voice just moves by one. And then finally, to go from four to one, it turns out that the smallest way to make that connection is again to leave A where it was, to take F sharp and move it down. So here I'm doing what we would call a downshift, and then D moves down to C sharp. So the total amount of motion here was 0, 2, and 1. So this last progression is what we call a downshift connection between the two chords, whereas the middle two connections were upshift, because all of the notes, if they had to move, they had to move up. The very first connection that I did, 1 going to 5, was that an upshift or a downshift? Let's see if you sort of get what these terms are about. So 1 going to 5 was an example of a downshift, because A moved down to G sharp, E moved quote-unquote, down to E, and C-sharp moved down to B. And kind of the remarkable thing is, when you're composing a chord progression entirely within a key, just using major and minor chords, it's always going to be either a downshift or an upshift that gives you the smallest connection. Really, the only challenge is figuring out whether you need to do downwards motion or upwards motion. And there's a nice simple rule for that, too, that we learned last time. You can think about it like this. Suppose that I'm starting on the note A. So A is the root of the chord that I'm starting with. I'm starting with a 1 chord. Now, if the next chord that I go to has a root of C sharp, E, or G sharp, so that is my second chord is a third above, a fifth above, or a seventh above, or really the same thing below, as long as the root is one of those three notes, C sharp, E, or G, it turns out that in those circumstances, I'm going to want to do a downshift. And that checks out, right? Because, for example, in these first two chords, I went from A to E. That's exactly A to E like I'm showing right here, and I did want to do a downshift. On the other hand, if I'm starting from the note A and my next root is an F sharp, that is a third below A, a D, a fifth below A, or a B, a seventh below A, if it's any of these, um, and maybe I'll color these blue to show that they're, they're different from the downshifts, if they're any of those, then in those cases, those are exactly the times when an upshift voice leading is going to give me the smallest motion between chords. And if you think about it, those are all of the possible roots in my key of A major. So this simple rule tells me exactly when I need downshifts or upshifts. And I think this is really beautiful and really nice because, of course, I basically just pick these by stacking thirds, exactly like you would do when you built seventh chords. If your root motion goes up by any of these by by any of these notes in this seventh chord, then you downshift. If your root goes down by any of these notes, then you upshift. And that's really all you need to know, all you need to remember to always be able to find the smallest connection between two chords within a key. I think it's pretty remarkable that it's that simple. So I want you now to take a moment and try to apply this. Specifically, um, we'll stay in the key of A major. We're just going to use A major for basically all of today. 
And let's think about another chord progression. Um, let's do this one, going from one to three to four, and then back to one. So that's going to mean A major, C sharp minor, D major, and then back to A major. I recommend let's start with exactly the same voicing of the one chord that we had before. And I want you to try to take this rule and apply it and figure out how to do the smallest voice leading for this whole chord progression. Once you're done, count up how far all of your voices have moved and then add the whole result. So over here, I would take one, two, one, two, two, one, one, two, and add all of those, which I guess is going to be three, five, that's eight, one makes nine, three more makes 12. So this chord progression required 12 half steps of motion total to do the whole thing. Figure out how much total half step motion you need to do to write this whole chord progression. I'll give you a minute or two to work that out. And while you're doing that, I'll write out the notes you need in each one of these chords in case you're not familiar with Roman numerals. So for the first chord, you need C sharp, E, and G. For the next chord, you need D, F sharp, and A. And then to go back to one, you need A, C, C sharp, and E. Okay, so to do this, you have to compose three chord to chord connections, one to three, three to four, and then four back to one. What's the total amount of half step motion that was necessary to make that whole progression work? Yep, eight is exactly right, perfect. Um, so I went ahead and wrote out my answer down here. So here's what I got just following the algorithm. To go from one to three, it turns out that you really don't need to move much at all. A goes down just one to G sharp. So that's a total amount of motion of one. C sharp minor to D major, that moves a little bit, that's four. Move up one, two, and one. And then D major going back to A, that's three. We move down using downshift. So one plus four plus three is eight altogether. Perfect. And I guess just to, just to reemphasize the point, um, this first connection was a downshift, so I'll draw a downwards arrow. The second connection was an upshift, so I'll draw an upwards arrow. And then the third connection was another downshift. So there's a downwards arrow. Notice that we had two downshifts. Those were both smaller and one upshift that moved by more. And overall, they cancel each other out, which means that the one chord that I start with is basically identical to the one chord that I end on. Not all chord progressions will work that way. Some will actually move you up or some will move you down from beginning to end. So just something neat about this progression. Okay, nice. So that's basically where we were last time. Now, one thing you may remember is last time, just to prove that this works, I generated a random chord progression. Um, I think the chord progression was one, two, six, four, one, and we worked through just applying this rule and figuring out how to do the connections from chord to chord. At the time, I said I couldn't think of any songs or, or pieces of music that use this chord progression. Um, but I did a little bit of research, and I found that the song Halo by Beyonce actually uses this chord progression. That's the main loop that she sings the whole song over. So I thought it would be nice to actually analyze that song and see where this idea comes up. Actually, kind of remarkably, she uses this smallest motion idea a lot of the time in the song. So I think it's a nice analysis. So to start off, um, here's just the chord progression in A major, one, two, six, four, one. And thinking about the rule, 
one going to two, that's an upshift. So you can see that all of these notes move up from the one chord to the two chord. Two to six is gonna be a downshift. Six to four, that's an upshift. And then four to one is a downshift. So if you go through and track all of the note motions that I did, they should follow the rule like that exactly. Let me play for you what this progression sounds like when you realize it this way according to the rule. So we're in A major. There's my A major chord. Here's, here's the chord progression. One, two, six, four, one. And that's the chord progression that more or less the whole song uses. Now, for copyright reasons, I can't play, I can't play the song for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you over to YouTube. Um, I've already linked this in the chat, but I'll send it on another time. I recommend go over to YouTube and listen to the first minute and a half of this, the first 90 seconds or so. Okay, so hopefully that gave you enough time to listen from the beginning of the song, more or less through the first chorus, which is the part of the song that I really want to talk about. All right, so we have this chord progression. We composed the smallest voice leading for that chord progression. I want to start by analyzing the melody of the chorus, and it's going to turn out that the melody of the chorus of the song really uses this basic voice leading quite extensively. So I'm gonna scroll up, and here at the top of the screen, you can see my transcription of the basic shape of the melody. Now you can see that I've, I've simplified the rhythms a lot and I've even left out some notes. Uh, that's partially because I, I think that like over transcribing rhythms in popular music is kind of a silly task. Um, so instead what I've done is I've bolded the words or the syllables that happen on strong beats, beats one and three of every measure. Those also happen to be, usually the, the notes, those line up with these notes that I've written as half notes. Those are kind of the notes that Beyonce sings most of her pitches on. I think those are kind of the main structural or landmark notes of the melody. And then all of the other notes, which happen on weaker beats, they sort of dip away from the main repeated notes. Those are kind of ornamental. They add a lot of nice color to the melody, but they aren't sort of directing the overall shape of the melody. So hopefully you can follow more or less what my, what my representation of the melody is trying to be. Um, I apologize for what I'm about to do. I'm gonna, try to, I'm gonna try to lead you through it. So again, our chord progression here is one, two, six, four, one. And, okay, I'm embarrassed to sing live, but so uh, it starts on A. Everywhere I'm looking now, I'm surrounded by your embrace. Baby, I can see your halo. You know you're my saving grace. So the basic idea here is everywhere I'm looking now, it's just A. Repeating a note, A, B, 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 da, A. It dips down to F sharp, brace. Baby, I can see you. But then she continues to repeat on A. Baby, I can see your hey. Still on A. Halo dips down to those low notes. You know you're my say. Goes back to repeating on A. Even grace stays on A. So that's 
that's basically the melody. The half notes that I've written there are just A, B, B, A, 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 A. When I strip away all the decorative notes, you realize that that's exactly just the notes of the of the simplest, smallest voice leading for this chord progression. This is exactly the top notes that we wrote last time following the rule. A, B, A, A, A. I think that's pretty neat. I think that's pretty remarkable that actually, totally fortuitously, this song uses in the melody of the chorus, which is sort of the main, you know, the, the main point of the song, uses exactly this simplest voice leading between the chords. Now, I think it's important to emphasize that, of course, the chord progression doesn't force Beyonce to sing this melody, but the chord, the chord progression allows this melody. Especially if we, want to, if we want to write a melody that's mostly on a single pitch and then dips away to it, um, that really makes those dips away feel really expressive. Those are the things that really stand out to me. So the way that here, you know, she dips down to F sharp, or here she dips way down to these low notes, those really stand out because the rest of the melody was so static. It kind of serves as a background for the more interesting things that the melody does. So the idea of a smallest voice leading isn't controlling what you do as a composer, but it serves as a baseline for what you can do. By the way, I think it's also interesting to think about where did the where did this chord progression come from? Why why did why did it get composed to be this as opposed to something else? And I think one part of that answer is to note that this is actually really similar to the most common four chord loop, which would be one, five, six, four, one. Right, it's really only one chord different. But I think that one chord of difference makes a big deal uh, in the character of the song. As we saw, one going to two, that's an upshift. Two going to six is a downshift. Six going to four is an upshift. Four going to one is a downshift. So there's this nice back and forth, up, down, up, down, up, sort of constantly uh, alternating. In the in one five six four one, the standard four chord loop, one to five is actually a downshift. Five to six is an upshift. Six to four is an upshift, and then four to one is a downshift. So the second half of the progression is, of course, exactly the same. But by making it one two six instead of one five six, we flip the order of the upshifts and downshifts. We go up and then down, rather than down and then up. And that changes the sort of the color or the feeling of, of this very beginning. And it allows the opening melody in its smallest version to go A, B rather than A, G sharp, which is what it would be if we did one, five, six, four, one. So I think that tells me something about the character of this chord progression or the kinds of motions it suggests. So I think it's pretty neat that the chorus of this song uses the simplest voice leading so obviously. It's worth, however, going back to the opening verse, the very first thing that Beyonce sings, in, in order to see a place where the melody, the melody there is not just the smallest voice leading, just to prove to you that this isn't dictating what a melody can do. So I'm going to scroll down and here we're looking at the very beginning of the whole song after the instrumental instrumental intro. So what's going on here? Same chord progression, one, two, six, four, one. But here the melody starts on C sharp. It starts on the third of the chord. Remember those walls I built? Well, baby, they're tumbling down. And they didn't even put up a fight. They didn't even make a sound. Like that. 
So what's going on here? Remember those walls I built? Well, baby, they're tumbling down. Something a little bit different right away is within the two chord, we have two different main notes of the melody. We have both D and B. So that creates more motion than has to exist. We're moving within the chord. Another thing I think that's important to notice right away is one of the nicest things in the whole song for me is what happens on this fourth line right here. They didn't even make a sound. The way that we sort of repeat this A and then we dip way down low to this D and C sharp right there. By the way, I'm transcribing this melody actually an octave above where, where Beyonce sings it. That low, that low D and C sharp is actually way down in bass clef. The, those are the pitches that she actually sings. I think that's really, really expressive. And it's a place where having a big motion in the melody is a really nice thing to do. So again, you're not forced or required or expected to do the, the smallest voice leading, but it can serve as a baseline for these more expressive large leaps, which happen only occasionally. Nonetheless, so this is clearly a place where we're doing something that's more extravagant than just the smallest voice leading. But even here, I think the smallest voice leading helps us understand where this melody comes from. So for instance, this C sharp right here, the melody starts on C sharp, that's the third of the chord, that would be in the smallest voice leading, this note right here. Now in the smallest voice leading, C sharp goes up to D, which I'm highlighting in red. That's actually exactly what Beyonce does at the beginning of this tune. C sharp goes up to D. Now at that point, after that, we switch from D to B, which is sort of like switching from this red note to the top note, which I'm highlighting in blue. So it's like we're switching to a different part of this simplest voice leading, and then we follow that for a good long time. B would go down to A, and that's what happens. And actually here, um, this sounds a lot like the melody of the chorus, including this sort of falling from A to F sharp. So there are some, some similarities between the verse and the chorus here, I think having to do with the fact that they're both deriving from this simple voice leading. We stay on A, we stay on A, we stay on A. So for a while, we just stick with this A that we can chant on. And then we go back to C sharp. We sort of drop down to this C sharp right here, which I think it's kind of nice to think about that as coming back to the note that we started on, but bumped down an octave. And notice that it's not only this C sharp right here, but this D, which I didn't transcribe this I didn't transcribe this in my reduction, but actually she also leaps down to that D at the end of the four chord. That D is, of course, this D right here. So you can think of the melody here is it's sort of tracing like a, like a braided path between two different lines within this simplest voice leading. We do the red for a while, we switch over to blue, we stay on blue, then we flip back over to red for the end of the melody. I don't know that this is the way that the melody was composed. I don't think that that's usually the way that songwriters come up with their tunes. But I think it might be helpful if you have a chord progression that you want to explore. Say you have a, a verse or a chorus that you really like, and you want to come up with some, some other melody that will fit the chord progression, this might be a way that you could think about it. You could say, okay, well, how do I trace a path through the simplest voice leading? And that might help you come up with a solution that you like. So that's the end of part one of my plan for today, is analyzing these two passages from Halo by Beyonce. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to add a little bit of nuance to this basic idea. In particular, I really want to emphasize that this rule is specifically for working with major and minor chords within one key, within um, what we would say a diatonic scale, like major or natural minor. And as long as you're, you're just working with triads within a major key, this rule will work perfectly. 
but it doesn't work for chords in general. It doesn't work if you start using other random types of chords, and it doesn't work if you break outside of a key. So there's something sort of miraculous, or at least special, about how chords fit into a key that makes this work. Towards the end of my video last time, I introduced, I introduced a really dissonant type of chord, something that's called the Viennese trichord. And I asked you to think about how this sort of thing would work with the Viennese trichord. Let's come back to that now as a way of seeing how when you work with other weirder sorts of chords, this rule totally goes out the window. So the idea with the Viennese trichord is we don't normally think of them as having roots, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, let's say that I'm starting with one whose root is A. And the idea with the Viennese trichord is instead of having a root, a major third, and a perfect fifth, what you have is a root, a tritone, and then a major seventh. So here my notes are A, E flat, and G sharp. And that gives you that gives you a really weird dissonant sounding chord. If you've ever heard of atonal music, composers like Arnold Schoenberg, they liked chords like this because they're very dissonant sounding. They sound very, very different from your standard major minor tonality. Now suppose I'm Arnold Schoenberg, and I want to co compose a chord progression that uses mostly chords like this. If I try to find the simplest voice leading, or the smallest voice leading between these chords, it turns out to be not at all easy to do so. So for example, let's imagine that I wanted to go from this chord, a version of the Viennese trichord with the root of A, and I want to go to one with the root of D. Alright, so I know I need a root D, I need a tritone, that'll be G sharp, and I need a major seventh, which would be C sharp. It turns out that if I try to do just an upshift or just a downshift, it won't even give me a complete chord. Let's see what happens. If I try to do a downshift, I'll start with I'll start with this A right here. And to downshift that, that A would need to move down to G sharp. That's the closest note. That's the closest note in the next chord. So A would downshift to G sharp. Where's E flat gonna go? Well, that would downshift to D. Where does D sharp or G sharp downshift to? Well, it would stay on G sharp. Remember that we have an A major key, key signature, so I'm not having to write all these accidentals. So that would be the downshift connection between these two chords. And notice that it doesn't give me a complete chord for this second one. It doesn't end up generating the note C sharp. That's a problem. So, okay, well, maybe, maybe what I need to do is an upshift. How would that work? A, where would A upshift to? Well, this is good news. A would upshift to C sharp. Where would E flat upshift to? Well, I guess the nearest note above E flat that's relevant is G sharp. So it would e, it would upshift to G sharp. And then G sharp, that would say the same. Okay, so far so good. But among these three notes, again, I don't have one of the notes. This time I'm missing the note D. So upshifts and downshifts for the Viennese trichord are never going to give me a complete, well, they aren't always going to give me a complete chord or the smallest voice leading. It turns out that the smallest voice leading between these two chords is A going up to C sharp and G sharp staying G sharp. But I think you can see what the best solution is. We were missing the note D. We really want D somewhere. The easiest way to do that is to bring E flat down to D. And that actually does turn out to be the smallest connection. G sharp moves by zero, E flat moves down by one, so I'll write minus one, 
and A moves up to C sharp, that's up four. That does turn out to be the smallest connection between these two chords, which is overall a total sum of five. But this is neither an upshift nor a downshift because some voices move up and some voices move down. Let's listen to what this sounds like. Um, just, for, just for the sake of hearing some really gross sounds. So there's my first chord, the one with the root of A. And here it is going to my chord with the root of D. I kind of like that, at least um, if I'm going for something gross sounding. And I'm really glad that this small voice leading exists because it's much easier to fit my hands around this. I don't really have to move the position of my arms at all to play this on the keyboard. If I were going to try to do it just sort of taking everything parallel, um, I'm going to have to think a lot harder about how that works. So there, there I'm moving just everything up by a perfect fourth. And that works, it still gives me those dissonant gross sounds, but it takes a lot more work, it feels more disconnected than simply doing like so. And if you want, if uh, this sort of thing appeals to you, you could explore these possibilities more with just any other random root motions. So we could say, let's take this same starting chord and maybe instead of taking it from A to D, let's take it from A to F sharp. So if F sharp is the root, I need a tritone. I guess that would be C. And then a major seventh, which would be F natural or E sharp. All right, so what's the best way to do this? Again, it turns out that we're going to have some motion up and some motion down. I think the best way to do this is G sharp would go down by a whole step to F sharp. E flat is actually going to go up by two to E sharp. So notice that this sharp right here, I'll color that in blue, that sharp is modifying this E. This, by the way, is a really great example of a place where it's really useful to have the note E sharp, because if I wanted to write F sharp and F natural at the same time, that gets really awkward in music notation when they're close to each other. So F sharp and E sharp right here, that works much more conveniently. And then finally, A, that will go up to C natural. So again, notice that when I did this, I had some motion down. G sharp to F sharp was down by two. E flat to E sharp, that's up by two. And then A to C, that's up by three. So again, the, the smallest motion between these two chords is neither an upshift nor a downshift. And I'm asserting to you that this is the smallest connection between these two chords. But can you prove that? You kind of just have to take it on faith. In fact, to really know that this is the smallest connection between these two chords, you would have to exhaustively explore all of the possible connections between these two Viennese trichords. Last time we talked about how you can enumerate how many different possibilities there are. Um, so we said you've got a root, then there's a tritone, and then there's a major seventh. And so if I think about those as the notes in the first chord, you can ask how many ways are there to pair the notes of the first chord with notes of the second chord? So for example, you could do root to root, tritone to tritone, major seventh to major seventh, but you could also do root to root, tritone to major seventh, and major seventh to tritone. Or you could do root to tritone, tritone to major seventh, major seventh to root, and so on. And it turns out that there are three factorial, three times two times one, different ways of making these connections. So there are, there are going to be six different possible voice leadings you would have to explore, and then see which one out of those six is the best. 
it gets even worse if you're dealing with larger chords, like four note chords. There are 24 different possible connections. That's a lot to consider. So it would be really nice to have a general rule that will tell me how all of this works, not just a rule that applies to chord progressions within a major key. There is a rule, there is a way to come up with such a rule, and that's going to be the moral of the story in my next lecture, lecture number three. If you want a really hard challenge, you might spend the next week toying around with this and trying to figure out what is, you know, what is the rule? How can I take this upshift, downshift idea and generalize it to all possible chord progressions? That, turn, that turns out to be pretty tough. I guess I should say chord progressions where, where you're dealing with two chords of the same type. So one Viennese trichord to another Viennese trichord, or one major minor chord to another major minor chord. That's tough. Um, I'd encourage you to explore it, see what you can come up with. We're not going to go there today. Instead, I think we're, we're going to take just one last step that helps us get there, but also helps us understand how you can be a little bit more flexible with this basic principle, even if you don't apply it all the time. Specifically, I want to think about not just the smallest Let's do this in black. Not just the smallest voice leading all the time, but what about the second smallest voice leading? How can I find that? So we're taking a, a specific question and we're going to try to generalize, little, generalize it a little bit. How can I find the second smallest voice leading? Well, let's start by talking about one reason that you might care. Let's think about having just a one, two progression. So this is the first two chords of, of the Beyonce song. And when we did the smallest voice leading for that song, we saw that it worked like this. So I had A, E, and C sharp. The smallest voice leading is just upshifting. So all of the notes move up to the nearest thing in the next chord. And if all I care about is making the smallest voice leading, that's the right way to do it. But in some styles of music, that's not the only thing that I care about. So for example, in classical music, classical music likes to have variety. In particular, it's uncomfortable when you have A going to B in two different voices like this. That's not enough variety in this chord progression. That's something that classical music calls parallel octaves. You have octaves A and A, B and B, moving in parallel with each other. And classical music doesn't like how um, similar those motions are. So let's imagine that we're a classical composer, and we do care about having small voice leadings, but it's not the only thing that we care about. We also like variety. So for the sake of variety, we can't do the smallest voice leading. How would I look for the second smallest voice leading, something that would give me variety without requiring too much motion? Well, first of all, we should figure out how much motion there was here, two half steps, two half steps and one half step for a total motion of five. Let's start from the same one chord and try to find another path to two that wouldn't use the upshift. Well, one possibility, again, my root, my root motion is still A to B, so I'm going to leave that the same. But one possibility that we might explore is instead of doing upshift, let's try to do a downshift. What would that look like? Well, A would go down a ways to F sharp. That's definitely moving farther than it had to move before. E would move down to D, and C sharp would move down to B. 
So that would be a downshift connection between these two chords. How much motion did that require? A to F sharp, that's down three. E to D, that's down two. And C sharp to B, that's down two. So that's the total amount of motion of seven. That's more, but that's actually not a lot more. It's fairly similar. It turns out that doing a downshift for these two chords is going to be the second smallest possibility. And I think if a classical composer were writing one going to two, this is actually probably the way that they would do it. It's not quite as small, it's not quite as smooth of a connection, but it's fairly small and it's more varied because because we don't have that thing called parallel octaves between the top notes and the bottom notes. So that's actually, it turns out, even a harder question to answer. How do I figure out the second smallest voice leading? We can find a rule for finding the smallest voice leading guaranteed, but I'm not sure that there is a rule for finding the second smallest voice leading, at least not for chords in general. I think, interestingly enough, there is a rule for finding the second smallest voice leading when you're doing Roman numerals within a key, like we've been doing. And maybe in the fourth lecture, we'll talk about what that is. But my main goal is just to show you how you can take this one basic concept and apply it to more situations by generalizing it in various ways. As one, as one last concept or one last application of, of this line of thinking. I want to talk about moving from a four chord to a five chord, and I want to talk about something related called the Mario cadence. And I see that we've already been at this for about an hour. It's because I spent maybe 20 minutes reviewing the last lecture. Sorry, I spent more time on that than I planned. Um, so just to let you know where we are, we probably have another 15 or 20 minutes worth of content to get through. Um, so if you're anxious and wondering how long I'm going to hold you over, um, we are at the end of class, but I have more to say, so I'm going to say it. So let's think about, let's think about this, 4 going to 5. And this will add a little bit of nuance to my upshift-downshift rule from last time. It's in a sense, the only exception or quasi-exception to that rule. What are the notes that I need to compose 4 going to 5 in A major? I need D, F, sharp, A, and E, G, sharp, B. The roots are D and E. Actually, let me put F sharp right there, and let me put A right, A right here. So according to our upshift downshift rule, if I'm starting with D and I want to go to E, well, E turns out to be a seventh below D. So we can think of the root motion as going down by 7. And if the root motion goes down by 7, then I need an upshift to make the connection as small as possible. So what I would do is I would just take all these notes. It turns out I can just shift them over and up. So that's my upshift. That's what the rule tells me ought to be the smallest connection between these two chords. Plus 2, plus 2, plus 2 for a total amount of motion of 6. Okay, and that's true. That It is true that this is the smallest connection between those two chords. But here's where the interesting thing happens. What happens if I try to do the second smallest connection? So instead of going 4 to 5 with an upshift, let's try to find something else going 4 to 5 that's almost as small. And again, your, your next thing to check might be trying to do a downshift. So let's see what happens if I downshift from 4 to 5. A would downshift to G sharp, F sharp, 
would downshift to E, and D would downshift to B. That doesn't look so bad, just looking at it intuitively. Let's count up the amount of motion here. A down to G sharp was one. That's actually better than any of the motions I had here. F sharp to E, that's two, so that's the same. And D down to B, that's three. That's a little bit worse, but counterbalanced by the one. So actually the total amount of motion with the downshift is also six. These two options, upshift and downshift, are tied. That's what I meant by saying that 4 going to 5 is kind of the one exception to the rule. Not that the rule is going to lead you astray, but that there's actually a tied option that the rule won't tell you about. When I go from 4 to 5, upshifting and downshifting are actually sort of equivalent. There is a little bit of difference. This one was very balanced, 2, 2, 2, whereas this one is a little bit unbalanced, 3, 2, 1. And again, if you're thinking like a classical composer who likes variety, you might see how you, you, could, pre you could prefer this downshift because there's more different types of motion in this second version of doing it. And if you know anything about classical harmony, you know that there's something sort of special about going from a four chord to a five chord. Um, depending on how you learned classical harmony, you might have learned it in different ways. You might have learned that four, five is a progression, whereas five, four is a retrogression. Or you might have learned that four is so-called predominant function and five is called dominant function. Again, they're supposed to have a, a particular order to them. I don't know if there's a connection here. I'm not sure if anybody knows. I don't know how you would figure it out. But it does seem significant to me that this kind of exceptional chord progression is something that classical music treats in a very special way. Just for our edification, let's hear what these sound like. So let me play 1, 4, 5, 1 to remind you of the key of A major. Here's the upshift version of 4 going to 5. Here's the downshift version of 4 going to 5. And I guess I'm going to uh, betray my classical bias a little bit, but like, I, I kind of do like the downshift version better. I like the variety that it gives me. Which is not to say that you, as a composer, or all styles, have to like that kind of variety. But it's nice to know that it exists, to know that there are these different possibilities. So, I think we should ask, specifically, when, when does this exception apply? And I've said that it's 4 to 5, but we can generalize a little bit. Um, the exception applies when the root motion is by major second. So for example, D to E was a whole step. And the chord qualities match. So we were going between two major chords, four to five, up by a whole step, and they're both major. Whenever you have that situation, that's when this exception applies. So when the root motion is by major second and the chord qualities match, then, and only then, is there going to be a tie. Upshifting or downshifting will give you the same amount of motion. Take a minute and see if you could figure out how many times is that possible in the major scale. That is, how many Roman numeral progressions can you come up with that follow this definition or that are part of this exception? Four to five is one of them. How many others are there? Okay, so I'm seeing in the chat two going to three would be one exception. 
So four to five, motion by whole step, two to three, oops, not two to two, two to, to three. Good, because for example, that would be like B minor to C sharp minor. It's a whole step between the roots and the qualities match. And in fact, that is the only other one that you can that you can find. If you know about the the diatonic chords, the ways that you can build chords within a major scale, you've got major one, minor two, minor three, major four, major five, minor six, and then diminished seven. So the only times you have two chords that are right next to each other with the same quality are two and three, both minor, and four and five, both major, that's where, that's where you have those matching qualities separated by a whole step. So those two possible chord progressions, forwards or backwards, are the places where this exception applies. All the other ones, um, there's a unique smallest voice leading given to you by my rule from last time. But for these, kind of interestingly, you've got two possibilities. Okay, so that's a little bit of nuance to the rule. Let's take this one further place. Let's take this to something called the Mario cadence. To give myself some more room to write, I'm going to erase all this stuff that I have right now. Okay. So, like I said, I want to talk about something called the Mario cadence. And this is going to serve as a bridge from the topic for today to the topic for next time, which is chord progressions that go outside of any given key. So the Mario cadence, if I'm in the key of A major, is a, is a chord progression that goes like this. It's an F major chord, and specifically F natural, going to a G major chord, G natural, going to an A major chord, A natural. If I were going to write that in terms of Roman numerals, we would call that a flat six chord. Flat because that F natural doesn't belong to the key. I have to lower it from F sharp. Flat six going to flat seven going to one. And this is called the Mario cadence by a lot of people because you hear it all over the place in, in the music to the original um, Super Mario, I think it's the very first Mario game, but I, I actually don't know for sure. I'm a, I'm a bad gamer. Anyways, so we know that we, we've got this chord progression, F major, G major, A major. And at first it might distress you because I was telling you that our rule only applies to chord progressions within a key. But actually our rule is a little bit more powerful than that. Even though these F major and G major chords don't belong to A major, they do belong, F and G do belong to some key. For example, F and G, if I think about the key of C major, that's just four going to five in the key of C major. So these two chords, they are a chord progression within one key, just some different key. And in that context, we could totally apply the rule. We could say, okay, well, I've got my root is F natural going to, root, to a root of G natural. And I know from the rule that the way that I should do this to get the smallest connection is just upshift. So there I have C go to D. Um, I also would need you know what, I'll do A next. A would go up to B. Those are the thirds of the chord in this case. And F would go up to G. So I know that in principle, any time I have F major go to G major, that should be the smallest possible connection between those chords. And then if I have G major go to A major, the same sort of thing should apply. Again, the G major doesn't technically belong in the key of A major, but G going to A belongs in some key. For example, it belongs in D major. So again, I could do the same sort of thing. I could have G go up to A. I could have D go up to E. B could go up to C sharp. And this high G could go up to a high A. 
And that's a nice, straightforward, small voice leading way of composing the Mario cadence. And in fact, a lot of the time when you hear the Mario cadence, it's going to be exactly this way. By the way, I want to emphasize that this is a C sharp, even though we had a C natural earlier in the progression. If you don't, if you're not familiar with this concept, here's what it sounds like. So again, that's the key of A major. The Mario cadence sounds like this. You can hear how it just sort of like starts here and then amps up each chord by a whole step. And that sounds pretty good. I think the, you know, the smoothness of the connection between these chords is one thing that makes it sound really successful. There's a really great video analyzing this progression that I linked to in my Reddit thread announcing this lecture. I'll link it again um, because I think it's a really nice analysis of this progression. But one thing that his analysis doesn't talk about is this idea of composing a small voice leading between these chords. So I want to think about it from that perspective. Now, as you know, we've been talking about this, uh, oops, I erased it, the exceptional rule that if you have the same quality, all major chords, and motion by whole step, there's another possibility. Instead of going up, I can also go down. So there should be another equally small way of doing this. Um, you know what, I actually, I think I want to change the way that I, the way that I voice this, however. So let's do the same progression, flat six, flat seven, one. I want to do it this way. I'll move the bass down an octave. And this time, I think it's going to be nice if I start with C natural as my highest note. So we'll have C natural. Um, let's put F natural right there. And then A right here. So we've talked about how you can do this progression with downshifts as well as upshifts, and you'll get an equal result. Downshifting from F major to G major, what's that going to sound like? A would go down to G, F would go down to D. Sorry, this should definitely be a G natural. And then C would go down to B. And in fact, if you count up the amount of motion, it does turn out to be the same amount of motion, six half steps of work each time. Now to go from G major to A major, again, let's downshift. G will go down to E, B will go down to A, and D will go down to C sharp. And it turns out that that is just as small of a voice leading for the Mario cadence as the one that goes entirely up. Let's listen to what this version sounds like. Also sounds pretty good to me. Actually, one thing that I really like about this one is how my lowest notes, F, G, A, and my top notes, C, B, A, they sort of triangulate on the note A, the tonic of the whole key. To me, that feels especially final, ending it that way. I kind of like doing it that way. In fact, um, if you're familiar with the, um, the very beginning of the Mario theme, it sounds like this. I'm going to switch over to the key of C major, because that's the key it's in. It sounds like this. And that right there, those last three chords that I played, that's the Mario cadence with this downshift or contrary voice leading.
So actually, Mario, the game, uses both of these voice leadings to compose the Mario cadence. I think it's actually really nice to have in your toolkit as a composer. If you like this sound, but you want a little bit of variety, you can realize it in different ways so that you have some amount of similarity, but some amount of contrast. Personally, for my money, I like, oops, I like this one. I like the way that the top goes down to A and the bottom goes up to A. That just really works for me. But again, I have a little, a little bit of bias for this sort of contrast as a classical musician. One last, one last really neat thing that I, I just can't resist mentioning, even though it's not exactly relevant, is um, I don't know if you've ever thought about the the very opening chord of this Mario theme, right? It starts with a, a really kind of weird dissonant thing. What's this chord right here? What are the notes in that chord? I'm not going to make you try to transcribe them by ear. I'll just tell you. It turns out that there's, I'll write, I'll write the lowest note down. There's a D, there's an F sharp, and there's an E. So you might think about that in different ways. You might say that it's something like a, a D major add nine chord or something like that. But I think there's actually kind of a, a neat little similarity that if I think about the three notes that go into this opening chord, they are D, E, and F sharp in order. Three notes separated by whole steps, just like these three notes separated by whole steps in the Mario cadence. So I think that there's a little bit of a like musical connection or what classical theorists would call a motivic connection between that opening chord and the Mario cadence that ends so many of the progressions in, in this soundtrack. I'm not sure that that was intentional, but I think it's a neat little connection that this idea of three notes separated by a whole step shows up as a single chord and then as a chord progression at various points. All right, so as a, uh, as a composition exercise that I recommend to you, if you like the sound of a Mario cadence, try to use this basic idea to come up with other, other versions of it. Specifically, what I mean is try to take this exceptional principle and come up with, come up with variations. So using chords that are the same quality and whose roots are a whole step apart, try to compose things that are like the Mario cadence. For example, instead of having roots that go up, like F, G, A, what if you have roots that go down, like E, D, C? And what if instead of using major chords, you use minor chords? So for example, you do E minor, D minor, C minor. Since this follows the exception that we've talked about, you should be able to come up with two equally small voice leadings for that. Try exploring this sort of thing and see if it allows you to compose any chord progressions that, that you like the sound of. Obviously, to like this one, you're going to have to really like minor chords, but you could try playing around with major chords as well. And finally, I'll remind you that what we're going to talk about next time is how do you take these ideas and apply them to progressions with any sort of chord and progressions in you know, that go anywhere in the chromatic scale, not just staying within one major key. This Mario cadence gives us a way of thinking about that, because I realized that F major to G major is going to be the same regardless of whether it's in the key or not. So you could start to think very systematically about, well, what if I go from F major to F minor? What if I go from F major to F sharp minor? What if I go from F major to F sharp major? You can just systematically consider all of those possibilities. And obviously there's going to be a lot of them to consider. I think there's 24. So if you work your way through all the possibilities, is there a general rule that describes all of them? That's the question we're going to talk about in my lecture next week.